When Gerard Charles arrived at the Royal Academy of Dance as its new artistic director, I learned a few things about him. I already knew that he was born in Britain, but had spent most of his professional dance career in the US. I knew he'd been in leadership positions at some of America's liveliest ballet companies, most recently the Joffrey Ballet in Chicago. But what I was most intrigued to learn was that his signature look was always capped by a pair of red cowboy boots. That's the kind of detail that stays with you. I'm David Jays, and this is Why Dance Matters, the Royal Academy of Dance podcast. Gerard is our guest today, so I'm going to ask him about the boots, because journalism, but there's a lot more to delve into as well. The RAD is about to move to a new, purpose-built home in Battersea in southwest London. How will that help it grow and reach into the community as well as to committed ballet heads? Gerard is a seasoned director, but how did he wrangle the RAD's flagship event, the Margot Fontaine International Ballet Competition, as an online experience during the pandemic? And in these uncertain times, what does the future of dance and dance teaching look like to him? I'm sure Gerard will have a lot to say. This isn't his first rodeo. It's time to saddle up. Gerard Charles, thank you very much for joining us on Why Dance Matters. Good afternoon. Great to talk to you. And when you came to the RAD as artistic director a few years ago, the thing that I learned about you and that stuck in my mind and has never yet been dislodged is your signature look. Gerard, it wasn't about your distinguished career, about your leadership of ballet companies. It was the fact that you were known for wearing red cowboy boots. How does a ballet person end up as a scarlet cowboy booted phenomenon? Purely personal preferences, I guess. Um, No, I I got the first pair of red boots um, when I was choreographing a piece in St. Louis and I really liked them. And then from then on, I always had to have a new pair whenever the other ones died on me. And most recently, a very good friend in the United States bought me a pair of handmade cowboy boots that fit me perfectly the day I put them on and are still wonderful today. So it's a great pleasure to wear them as well as a good fashion statement. (laughs) And so they're still in use even in sedate England. I even wore them to the V&A exhibition for the RAD. Perfect. Very good to you. (laughs) So we're going to talk about a lot of RAD stuff because there is a lot going on. But just before we do that, I think I remember you saying that the moment you committed to ballet as a career during your training, ironically and even perversely, was just after you suffered quite a serious injury. You'd broken your back, I think. Is that right? That's correct. Yes, I broke my back and everybody at the Royal Ballet School was very solicitous of me and trying to say, well, now, darling, what are you going to do? And it was at that point where I was kind of not interested so much in performing as a career that I said, I am going to perform. So I guess I've always been contrarian at some degree. It's a good quality and probably a useful one for an artistic director. Well, I mean, I like to think that I'm creative more than just opposite. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) but kind of, you know, going with your instinct and trusting it. Is that something you've always had? Or does that develop in time? I think that one always has an instinct. But I think as a director, you have to also think about the practicalities that surround it. Anytime a situation arises, I have multiple thoughts in my head. One will often sift to the top. But then I do want to take the time to reconsider where I'm at and take into account all the other ramifications of any particular decision. Because as we know, in life, nothing is black and white. There's many shades. And it's really trying to work out the best solution to the current crisis. And of course, we've all been challenged over the past year and a half. It has come to the fore that I think as an artistic person, there's been many creative solutions that although we haven't solved the world's problems, I think have helped move us along, at least in the interim. Have you always been able to stay fairly calm 
in the face of, if not adversity, just those kind of difficult considerations that I guess they're the job description for an artistic director, aren't they, really? There's just every day is another problem to be solved. Are you quite good at stepping back from that and finding a way forward? Every day I try and be able to be better at stepping back. I think there's always an automatic reaction in your mind, if not in your vocal response um, to a situation. <laughs> but then I really do try and take a step back, as I said, before I make any final decisions to have a rational discussion with myself or with other people to try and find the right solution. It's not just challenges. It is also opportunities that are part of the package. And certainly at the moment, the Royal Academy of Dance is just about to move into a new purpose-built headquarters in Battersea in London. What does that mean to you? Because that's a building that has been specifically designed for dance for the RAD. Well, of course, having a purpose-built building makes life in your everyday work so much easier. But it goes beyond that. I think it, it, it gives a whole sense of new spirit to the organization. It's, it's a physical symbol of our march forwards into the next 100 years. Of course, it just celebrated our centenary. As much as we have spent the last year celebrating the achievements of the first 100 years, this is very much the opportunity to start thinking about what does the next 100 years bring? How do we best serve our members? Where does the RAD go next? Not necessarily to throw out everything that we've had before. In fact, much the opposite, to build upon the strengths of the past, to really think about all the new challenges that we have in life. The last year and a half has definitely made changes in everybody's lives. And I think a lot of those are going to be permanent. But how do we take advantage of some of the things that have happened? Certainly, I think there's a lot more personal commitment to time and quality of life. Ballet and dancing really do fit very closely in with a lot of people's priorities right now. So how do we take advantage of that? How do we take advantage of the fact that we are actually all now being forced to be much more au fait with electronic communication? So now with an organization that has teachers in 89 different countries, how can we better communicate with all those people? We're sitting here in London. They're in all sorts of different time zones. How we can make them feel part of this family that we have and created? How can we use the strengths of what they have done in their own areas to reflect back to everybody else to learn how to work better together? So... The new building is full of new ideas as well as full of new facilities. And I hope that many of the lessons we learn from working more closely with our local community will also be ideas that we can exchange with our members around the world so that they may also find the ways to connect to their grassroots culture as well. I remember the first time I visited the current RAD headquarters. I got terribly lost um, because it is a bit tucked away and it's around a rather lovely little courtyard. And once you know it's there, it, it's wonderful. But the new building is going to be much more street facing. It's going to be much more in the community. And what does that mean in terms of reaching out and sharing the RAD's work more widely with people who aren't just devoted ballet students and ballet teachers? It's certainly part of our mission as the RAD to connect with people who are not necessarily mainstream dance people. Everyone can dance. I mean, that's our motto. You know, we believe everyone can dance. And so the physical presence of this new building on a very main road with a high rise building on top of it that can be seen from miles around does draw a lot of attention to where we are compared to where we are right now. I will say I will miss the history and the idiosyncrasies of the old building, but I think everyone will be thrilled by the ease of use of the new building. You know, as far as connecting the community, this is something that's very important to me. We have many people who may not have access to dance, even though they're on our doorstep here. Seeing the building in their neighborhood, knowing that our doors are open, not only for them to participate in our offerings, but to also be a welcoming place for them to present some of the things that they are proud of as well, is a very important part of how we wish to connect to our community locally here, but also it's a bit of a message around the world as well that we are not closed doors, we are an open policy organization. You said just before you were talking about what we've learned during this time, the pandemic time has been a very difficult one. It's also been one that's force people to reflect on what's important to them, why they do the thing they do. And many have started to look for other paths. <laughs> what did it make you realise about the path that you've chosen? 
I think it really did reinforce to me the value that I would derive from being part of this wonderful art form. We had to close down so many operations in real life. We had to cancel the Fontaine International Ballet Competition for one year. And the second year, we held it online. But as part of that, we were coaching RAD students around the globe. And it wasn't only myself and a small team of people, but we had a huge and wonderful array of coaches that taught the students. And we got to have half hour sessions with each of these students to talk to them about the dancing and to coach them in their solos. And it was the most uplifting and rewarding experience. And it was happening at the depths of the pandemic crisis. I can't tell you how everybody has reported back to me who was part of that saying, you know, it really made a difference to them. And you can see the joy in everybody's faces when they had those exchanges. And it just reminds us that that human ability to communicate, not only by voice, but in dance and emotion, there's so many layers of connectivity that you get with dance. It's connecting your brain to your physicality, to the music, to responding to stimulus and processing information. There are so many things that are so rewarding about being part of dance. And that really was reinforced with me. Um, you know, you can get into a sort of a, a managerial position where I guess I was going to work, but we remember what dance is, what it means to you, what it means to an audience to watch people who are dancing. It is just a very important and visceral part of who we are as human beings, I believe. And on the Fontaine, on the, the competition, usually, of course, the final is held in one of the world's leading theatres. There's a full audience, there's that sense of occasion. How did you give it that special feel? How did you create an atmosphere when you knew that all of the candidates, everybody watching, everybody involved was logging in from their own laptop on Zoom? Indeed. Well, of course, there's no substitute for being all together in person. So, you know, when we have all the candidates together, they spend 10 days together, they get to know each other, they get to feed off each other. And of course, the same is true in a performance. A live performance is a really much of an interchange between the performer and the audience. And, you know, you feed each other. You couldn't recreate that online. I mean, you know, you can do your best with all the individualized coaching. That really went a long way to help what we tried to do was to give different kind of experiences. So interspersing some of the competitive elements of the competition, the, actually showing the competitors for what they had achieved. We also wanted to show some background stories some behind the scenes stories so people could have a greater understanding of the journeys that they had actually taken and the challenges they had met. We had people who were coming to the studio to record their solo to be put online and the country locked down and they couldn't get into the studio to record. We had dancers who were going to the studio to rehearse and the studio door was locked. So they were dancing, their coaching online on the patio outside, people taking class in the middle of the night because that's when the live link could happen. So, I mean, there's been amazing stories of triumph, determination of the young people that took part and also their teachers that helped coach them. I do worry when I talk to people about their experience during this last 18 months that I'm sort of leading them down a path of doomfulness and you're not being doomy at all but I just wonder what personally what did you enjoy during the lockdown months well that's what you're assuming I did no uh... <laughs> <laughs> the lockdown for me of course was a challenge you know there's personal things that I got great pleasure out of thankfully the first good English summer I've experienced in decades but I think for me obviously there are challenges of lockdown our members have suffered terribly great reductions in income some studios unfortunately had to close so there's some very harsh realities of this pandemic that are not going to be easily undone and I don't think we're really out of it yet and we don't really know what the future is but for me, I think, again, it's, it's back to knowing the values that I have in life, to see the determination of so many people, we're young and old in our profession, to keep going, to find creative ways to keep dance alive, and to know how much it is valuable to them and how much is valuable to us as humankind. It's more than just a business and something we do, but it really is um, it's a, it's a, a personal reward feeling. When you joined the RAD, you were leaving 
the kind of quite tight world, I guess, of elite professional ballet and joining a huge international network of dance teachers, dance students, examiners in 80 something countries right across the world. How easy has it been to give that a sense of connectedness to people who are working in such different conditions and places? It certainly has been a wonderful learning curve, I must say. I think I took the job here because having worked in the professional world for so long, I was seeing a lot of young dancers coming in, trying to get jobs, auditioning, having their first jobs in companies, and seeing the kind of help that maybe if they'd had it a little bit earlier, they'd be that much more comfortable with starting their careers. And so I thought this was a wonderful opportunity to get right down to the beginning. We, we, you know, we introduced dance in so many major and minor places around the world. Teachers are doing amazing pioneering work. So many of the big names in dance today have started off in relatively small towns around the world with a local dance teacher who somehow inspired them to adore dance, to make their life's work in the field. And so I think it's really an honor to work with those teachers that are doing that work. They may never get to coach their student all the way to their professional careers, but they're giving such a great foundation to them. And it's really in their honor and in their support that I take on this role here at the RAD. Was there one teacher who lit that spark for you? I think there've been many teachers. And I think that's the magical thing about dance is sometimes there's a good teacher for that moment in your life. So someone who's maybe a great first teacher may not be the greatest to get you all the way. Someone who just grabs you somewhere mid-career can give you that extra boost. So there's been many career advancing teachers that I've worked with, and I'd hate to single out any one for the lack of forgetting the others. <laughs> my first teacher was an amazing person who made me absolutely fear quitting. So I kept on going, but she was very generous and obviously gave me some good foundations. And then all my teachers have had along the way since then have given me different levels of inspiration and show me different sides to dance. I continue to grow. I continue to learn from the teachers that I can meet today. And I think those first classes, that was in Folkestone, I think, on the south coast of England. Is that right? It was indeed. I grew up in Folkestone. That was my first teacher, yes. Was it love at first step or did it take a while to get under your skin? I was introduced to ballet because my brother, who's six years older than me, was absolutely in love with ballet. And he was taking ballet classes every week. And I was the younger, more obnoxious brother who was on the side of the studio being pretty loud. And the story goes, as they said, well, if you think you're so good, you should do this too. And so I was coerced into doing ballet. And I really was going to go into musicals. And I remember my teacher took me for an audition for the Royal Ballet School. And on the tube there, I had no idea I was auditioning. I just thought I was meeting some friends of hers. So on the tube, on the way there, she asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, I want to be a tap dancer. And I think she would have killed me there on the spot if she could have done. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as they say, one thing led to another. And today I, I can absolutely see the value and the joy that I get out of having been part of this world. And whereas so many dancers may say, oh, I would never wish this for my child. I can't say there has been bad side to having been involved in this world. How were your parents about this career choice? Because it's, it's not without risks. It's one that can be, as we've mentioned, can be really cut short by a, a bad injury. It's not an easy line to hoe. So how did your parents feel about you committing to that? Well, my mother was a, a wonderful lady. Um, she wanted to be a dancer herself, but at the time she was growing up, it wasn't considered a, a profession for young ladies, quote unquote. So um, she actually ended up being a theatrical agent and a, a circus agent. So she was oh, wow. very much involved in the theater and was all for her children being part of the theater. My father worked for the Customs and Excise, was a very normal gentleman who was not anti my dancing at all, but probably would have preferred if I'd have been the architect that I otherwise would have been. I love the idea of your mum being a circus agent. Were there sort of fire eaters and elephant trainers turning up at the back door? You know, every Saturday night, there was a, a mixed cast of people who'd come in after the shows and stop by our house before they made their way back to London or wherever else they were from. So yes, we actually had a very nice mixed bag of people visiting us. And my brother actually joined the circus for a month one summer. 
because um, we were friends with one of the families there and he toured in the caravan and they were a flying trapeze artist act and he got to feed the lions and do all those other things. Oh my, that is exciting. <laughs> that is, it's not quite running away to join the circus, but even so. Yeah, he, he, he ran away, but he came back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a trial escape, very yes. good. We've said that the RAD is at its heart. It's about dance teachers, often in really small schools, in small neighbourhoods and localities, working with students dedicatedly who they know. There is also a link to the, the height of the profession, as it were. And I know that every year the RAD is involved in World Ballet Day, which is when all the world's leading companies bring cameras into their studios and rehearsal rooms and sort of open their doors and show what's going on. Why is it important that the RAD is seen to be mixing it with the, the world's leading companies? One of the powerful things about the RAD is there is this continuum. You can join your journey through the RAD at many different point leases. It can be your very first encounter with dance. It can be with one of the teachers that are coaching the pre-professional world. It can be with an artistic director who's a former RAD dancer, maybe even a current board member. And then there's also our silver swans that can take you beyond your prime dancing years, but into a very satisfying encounter with ballet as well. And then, of course, there's the pathways into being a teacher and continuing the circle back around again. So I think the RAD has got so many aspects to it, and being part of World Ballet Day will hopefully highlight to some people exactly what that is. Now, we're not going to be presenting ourselves like we are the Royal Ballet performing Manon or something like that, but we we really wish to tell the story, particularly this year, about how our teachers have influenced ballet around the world, about the strength and resilience they have shown this year, the creativity, and also to paint a picture that maybe a lot of people don't understand about who and what we are. And also, again, to demonstrate this pathway that you can start off in very modest places, you can go to great heights, and then you can come back and give back to the profession afterwards. And as we've said, there are so many teachers involved, so many people involved in making up the RAD and so many different kinds of projects from the Fontaine competition, which is with some of the brightest and best and most talented young dancers in the world, to classes for absolute beginners, to the Silver Swans, which is for people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, to just experience the joy of dance. So from an artistic point of view, what's the thread that runs through all of those things? I think there are a couple of threads that run through everything. First of all, has to be the enjoyment of dance. No matter what the challenges are, what the technical aspirations may be, what the physical realities may be, the ultimate reason to dance is because it's good for you. It feels good. It's an emotional way of connecting your mind to your body. It's a way of being yourself. Sometimes it's very easy to get wrapped up in technical demands or, you know, what the choreography may demand or, in our case, with some exams, it's settings that are complicated to remember. But that's really the technicalities of it. The reason we want to develop our technique, the reason we want to remember settings and things like that is so that we can then express ourselves. It, it would be like learning a language and not being able to know how to put a sentence together or knowing what you want to say with those words. It's very important to always bear in mind that there is a communication that's going on through dance. You know, unfortunately, sometimes people feel exposed with dance because, you know, they're, they're having to say, this is what I believe in. This is the way I feel. This is my body. You can see it. It's really about surmounting your personal insecurities, I think. Allow yourself to be free to express yourself, to share with other people, and to feel part of a community of people that are sharing all those same expressions and emotions as you are yourself. If we're talking about dance being for everyone, but of course, historically and, and even today, Dance, especially ballet, hasn't had the best record in opening its doors and being welcoming to everyone. It's had a real problem with diversity. And I wonder what can teachers do, what can the RAD do to transform that landscape, especially for young dancers? 
I am, and so is the RAD, very committed to making sure that dance is for everybody and to understand what those barriers are. I think, obviously, none of us wish to put up any signs or say anything that discourages anyone from feeling welcome here, but we're perfectly aware that that is the reality for some people. When you look at different cultures, dance is for example, much more a man's thing than a woman's thing. Ballet seems to have this reputation as being a woman's pastime. But at the same time, there's amazing male dancers. So, you know, there's no like image problem that there isn't someone to look for. So I think it's a multifaceted question of how to best solve this. But it really is a matter of finding what it is that is satisfying in the human spirit, I think, that to say that this is good for everybody. Now, Having said that, you can name anything in life, I think. We all have our favorite things and the things that appeal to us, ring a chord in our hearts and others that just don't don't make sense to us. So I'm aware that I'm not going to be, and my art form is not going to be something that everyone will respond to positively, but it has to be accessible and it has to give everyone a chance to experience it and make up their own minds rather than having a predisposed or pre imagined reaction to it. And so I think one of the things that we can do is to show dance in all its forms and to give people a chance to see it and be maybe surprised that, oh, it's not what they thought it was. We got to break down the mysteries. We got to have the doors wide open and let people see it for what it is. Gerard, we have covered a lot of ground. You have been scampering far and wide in your red boots. So I'm going to stop. But first, I just want to ask one last question, which is, for you, why does dance matter? Dance matters to me because I feel it is a natural extension of who we are as a human. I think we were all dancing before we were even communicating in our voices. And so I think it's such an elemental part of who we are and it matters to every single person and we need to get back in connection with ourselves to allow ourselves to feel that we can move and express ourselves and not feel rigid and tight even behind a microphone. (laughs) I am cowering here behind the microphone, but only to say thanks so much, Gerard. It's been a real pleasure. Oh, you're welcome, David. And I know you, you have been moving and um, expressing yourselves, I'm sure, all this time. (laughs) Squirming and waving my hands around, it's what I do. (laughs) Thanks so much again. You're welcome. If you'd like to know more about the RAD's new home in London or how you can catch them on World Ballet Day on the 19th of October, do check out our show notes and follow the RAD on social media. And please do follow and subscribe to us at Why Dance Matters so that you never miss an episode and we make our way to more scarlet-booted dancing cowboys. That's the dream. Our guest today was Gerard Charles. Why Dance Matters is made with the RAD team of Celia Moran, Melanie Murphy and Charlie Strachan. And our artwork is by Bex Glendinning. Is our producer Sarah Miles wearing red cowboy boots? You just can't tell when everyone's working remotely. But I like to think she is. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon. <laughs>